Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So I'm here in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey today. And I'm a little bit late because I had to get my truck fixed this morning, something with the cooling system, a hose broke. So I figured I'd zip that up since it's been so cold or before it gets really cold. Uh, it's a couple days before Christmas. I think today's December 22nd, it's Wednesday, 21st. Anyway, uh, I'm here to do this service here today. And the first thing I need to do is to shed the load. So I'm gonna go inside the house Turn off all the main breakers. I'm, I'm sorry, turn off all the individual breakers and then turn off the main breaker. And as you can see, there's no lock on this meter. Okay, so that's good. Um, but the other day, as you know, we were here, we did the electrode system and we started the hot tub wiring right there. And today we'll be doing the service. So without further ado, let me go unlock the door, get down to the basement or the first floor, rather, it's a bi level home or a split level, bi level home and uh let's shed the load it's very dark down here but this is the old 100 amp panel that we're going to be shedding the load and replacing we'll be putting in a 200 amp service and as you see we got this emt that's going to be a challenge i got this old 12 wire going directly through the concrete here i'm sorry through the cinder block that is definitely a violation of the code to go right like that but i'm going to leave it and uh, the inspector asked me to do something with it, I will, uh, but uh, I'm not gonna invite that. It's where I'm working, even though it's not done right, I didn't do it. I'd like to make it right, but of course that's a billable item. So let's, uh, let's turn off the load here. All right, so the way I do this is just one at a time. All right. And then the last one is the main. All right, so now there's no power to all the branch circuits in the building, which is good because when I pull the meter and when I disconnect from the utility, there'll be no arcing. And arcing, what's happened, what happens when there's an electrical load that's abruptly shut off. All right, so now the service has been cut out and there's no power coming into the house. We've disconnected from the utility. We've pulled the meter, we've shed the load. Uh, one of the most important things that we need to do is we need to place that meter in a safe place away from the work. Because if we damage the meter, well, then we're screwed. We have to get JCP&L out here, put a new meter in, or we need to bypass the meter. We need to do something besides put that meter in. And I'd rather avoid that if I, I'd like to avoid that if I can, rather than have to have that emergency and have a meter, a temporary, get in trouble, whatever the case might be. So put the meter someplace where it won't get hurt or damaged. I'd also like to add that if you don't take out a permit and you're doing this work and you damage that meter and you can't use it, you're really screwed. You'll be fined and, uh, you know, there could be other consequences from the town, from the utility company, et cetera, et cetera. That's a real big deal tampering with that meter especially without a permit or a license. So here, as I've talked about before, uh, once that panel covers off and the power has been disconnected, we want to start identifying these circuits the best we can. Now, they were identified in the previous panel legend, uh, but a lot of it was either penciled and unreadable or a giant magic marker, and nobody knows how accurate that is. Uh, I did pay attention, obviously, to the double pole circuits, and as you can see, I'm using red tape. 
to tape both to both the, con the ungrounded conductors together so that I know that those are double pole circuits. Both of those double pole circuits, and there was only two in this house, uh, both were for the air conditioning system. One was for the exterior condensing unit, which was a double pole 30. And the other was for the air handler up in the attic. I believe that's where it's at. Um, <clears throat> and that was for the, uh, the air handler. So the one change that I did make is the air handler itself uh, was 14 gauge wire. And it was under a 20 amp breaker before, which of course is wrong. For the double, uh, for a double pulse circuit for an air handler, uh, for all circuits, we want to go by the gauge of the wire. Unless it's for air conditioning equipment, as I'm talking about here. So the condensing unit, I put back under a 30. And I'll have to check uh, when I go back there to look for the minimum circuit ampacity. And of course, the maximum overcurrent protection. And that'll give me the the correct size circuit breaker to install, but it'll be a double pole. It has double pole 30 at the moment here, and being that it's a week before Christmas, I don't think they'll be putting on the air conditioning anytime soon, so that's not too big of a issue if I did put the wrong size circuit breaker in for the condensing unit. But that'll all be checked out uh, before we're done. There was also a few multi-wire brand circuits, that's what we call it in the trade. That's a really a three-wire circuit which has a black, a red, a white, and a ground. And what's unique about those circuits is that we don't normally install them too much, too often anymore uh, because everything, needs, everything new needs to be arc full nowadays. So <clears throat> what's unique about them is you have two circuits sharing the same common neutral, which is fine. It was fine for many, many years, but now with the arc fault, unless you have a double pole arc fault circuit breaker, which costs a fortune, you normally just run two wire circuits and they are safer um, with a multi-wire branch circuit you need to have a common trip circuit breaker for them uh, what that means is if you were to turn off a single pole circuit for the black wire of the multi-wire branch circuit the red wire would still be working and so would that neutral so if that neutral is in the same box as the black wire now you're working in there and you only have one of the circuits off you can get killed by the neutral if you um, accidentally shock yourself obviously so when you have the multi-wire branch circuit you want to put a double pole common trip circuit breaker in there so that when you turn off that circuit there is no current on the neutral conductor the other thing about a multi-wire branch circuit i'd like to add is if you have say 10 amps on your black wire and you have 5 amps on your red wire that neutral is going to carry the unbalanced current which is 5 amps Alrighty. now if you were to lose that neutral the properties of the branch circuit change. When it's a two-wire circuit, we have what's known as a parallel circuit. All right, you got a hot wire and a neutral, and they run in parallel with each other. However, when you have a multi-wire branch circuit, a three-wire circuit, you have a black, a red, and a white, and a ground. If you lose that neutral ground, grounded conductor, you will have what's known as a series circuit. And so some of these devices that are plugged into that circuit, like a TV or a computer, might see a higher voltage and you could ruin that equipment. Anything that's got a microprocessor, if it sees a higher voltage than it's supposed to see, it's fried and you're in trouble. So that's one reason why people steer uh, away from using the multi-wire branch circuits. Of course, that won't happen if you have a double pole circuit breaker while you're working on the circuit. So that's why we want to put double pole circuit breakers on multi-wire branch circuits. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about this. I'd love to hear from, hear from you. The old timers would use these, um, they're called cut hammer uh, nails, or cut nails, and they would drive them directly through the wood and into the cinder block to attach the cinder block, uh, to attach the wood to the cinder block. Nowadays, a lot of people use tap cons. I prefer to use lags and shields when I attach um, framing members to a concrete wall or a cinder block wall like this. Uh, and I, I had all intentions of doing that on this particular job until I opened up my SDS case and I realized I didn't have any more lags and shields. But I did have some two and a half inch or three inch tap cons. And that's what I wound up using here. They work just as well, but I still like to use those lags and shields. It's just a little more heavy duty and um, 
unfortunately, sometimes the tap cons don't always work in the holes that they've been drilled in. But I, uh, you'll see when I put the framing members up here, I used three on the top and three on the bottom. And I'm 100% confident that the framing members will be held tightly and securely to the concrete cinder block wall for decades. These particular tap cons that I used required a 3 16 masonry drill bit to um, the pile out of the hole. So what I did was I used that bit to go right through my lumber, right into the cinder block wall. And then I held it tightly up against the wall while driving in a two and a half or three inch tap con screw to secure each of the boards uh, to the cinder block. <clears throat> now here I'm using a three quarter inch sheet of plywood i believe it's 48 inches long and 32 inches wide uh, and this gives me plenty of room to mount the new electrical panel and also to mount any kind of junction box or any other thing that might need to be uh, mounted to this wall sometimes people like to mount their uh, modem and their wireless router put a little table on the side there or a little shelf rather i should say um, but i always like to make the board uh, pretty large if i can and of course i choose a nice color that's neutral to the room and to the panel, and so the work looks terrific. And so after I cleaned up what was on the floor in front of me so I could have some room to work, uh, I take out the knockout in the back of this panel here, and what I wanna do is I wanna come through the wall and come directly into the back of the panel so you don't see any conduit or service entrance cable from the outside it's just gonna go right into the enclosure here uh, but what I did was I mounted the first piece of lumber to the cinder block wall right in the spot where I needed to make the KO uh, to the out from the panel to the outside so I get everything straightened out here and I mark where I want to have my knockout or my hole use a hole saw in the panel board here and then through the lumber mounted to the cinder block wall I had it temporarily put the panel where I wanted it mark the hole and then take it down and then take that backer board off as well which was kind of a, a time waster but you know everybody makes mistakes including myself so I did what I had to do it took a little detour to get to where I wanted to go uh, but I got there and uh here you'll see I'll take this board back, take the panel down, take the board down, and then I'll use the hole saw to make the hole where I want it. Uh, but I'll drill the pilot hole first in the middle of that hole you see up there. And um, there you go. So we all make mistakes. So now I'm able to drill a pilot hole through to the outside so I know where to make my two inch hole beginning from the outside except I still have the meter enclosure outside and I'm hitting the back of that with the bit. So now I have to stop what I'm doing, go back outside and remove the meter so I can make the hole large enough to send a two inch PVC right into the back of the main breaker enclosure.
Here I'm using my Milwaukee M18 SDS Max drill. Now this is a super size uh, hammer drill and I'm using a 2 and 9 16 core drilling bit which as you know is quite expensive uh, but it really does the job nice. So what I plan on doing is running 2 inch PVC between the back of the meter into the back of the panel through the cinder block wall. And the reason why I'm using a 2 and 9 16 bit is because that's the actual size of the two inch PVC. It's actually a little bit larger than the, than the two inch PVC. And the reason why it's a little bit larger is because we'd like to have a little bit of play to move us around. The other thing that's important when drilling this hole is that you drill on a slight incline in case water were to ever get inside this conduit, it would have to work its way uphill to get inside the panel, which of course would be a substantial amount of water if that were to ever happen. There, now you see I have the two inch PVC coming in from the outside into the basement and I'm able to put this three quarter inch uh, mounting board and attach it to the framing members which were attached to the cinder block wall and uh, we'll be coming down the home stretch pretty soon. This is probably the most difficult part of this job is getting this all to fit right on an existing service like this. So you can change it around a little bit. Obviously you're putting in a larger panel and we're putting in a larger mounting board but it's still the same amount of circuits for the time being. And uh, so you got to work with what's there. Obviously try to make it look neat and professional. That green screw that I'm zooming in on here is the main bonding jumper. And I know I've been through this before, but this actually bonds the system grounded neutral to the enclosure. And this is where our equipment grounding conductors for our branch circuits originate. Thanks for watching guys. We'll see you on the next one.